Welcome all to this interview. Today, we have a person that is very dear to my heart. Um, his name is Sharif. So Sharif is a competent magician. He's an experienced card reader and co-owner of Convos Over Cards. He is also a founding member of the group Arabic Theurgy and Magic, which is where we first met. So shortly after I announced my services, I was talking to Sharif. And during that conversation, he had the brilliant idea for us to host a short interview in which he would share about his experience having me as a practical coach. So without further ado, we'll proceed with the interview. I'm going to ask Sharif a couple of questions. And of course, he's just going to share what he is comfortable uh, with sharing. So first off, Sharif, please tell the listeners more about yourself, your background as a magician, and mm -hmm. your experience with different systems of magic. Yeah. So I'm, a, I'm from New York. I'm, I was born and raised in Queens. You know, very early on in my life, I got introduced to the concept of four elements. And interestingly enough, I got introduced to that concept through the hip hop culture, you know, and when I was young, I was in, I don't, I think I was in like the third or the fourth grade and it was, I was in a social studies class and we were learning about the ancient civilizations, ancient Greece, ancient Egypt. And there was mention of the mystery schools. And I'm like, yo, what is a mystery school? I want to, I want to find one, you know, you know, so fast forward to my college years. It was my, actually my, it was like my junior year in college is, which is when I really started to get into alternative spirituality. Like I've always been pretty spiritual, but, you know, I started to notice that I had an inclination towards the occult and I'd eventually meet the person that introduced me to reading tarot cards when I was a junior in uh, college, when I was a senior in college, I started to practice chaos magic. And through from there, did some research on Aleister Crowley and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And then I ended up reading the book, uh, The Mystical Kabbalah, which was for a long time was my favorite book. This is my favorite book. I was really, you know, really impressed by Dion Fortune and what she had to say. And I, you know, from there, I just set out to find a, a Golden Dawn Lodge. And I found an online Golden Dawn group. And they uh, were working with this big green book called Self-Initiation into the Golden Dawn Tradition. You know, so I began to work through that book. I didn't get very far. I got, I didn't even get through like the entire uh, neophyte uh, ceremony. From there, I, I started to get interested in Thelema. And I started mm -hmm. to do research on the Lima and stuff. And I found my way into uh, the Temple of the Lima. In 2006, I got initiated into the Temple of the Lima. And I'm a member of Iwas Temple Number 8. We're located in New York City since 2006. And so the temple itself is founded on the original Golden Dawn manuscript. So a lot of the formula has been, been rewritten to conform to the Book of the Law and the teachings of the Lima. But I essentially found what I was looking for, which was a Golden Dawn style order within the Thelemic context. And so, so as I was advancing through the outer order, which I'm still an outer order member, but I'm almost to the point where where I can go into the second order. As I was going through the, the degrees of the order, I began to explore, you know, African traditional religions and uh, working with spirits, specifically the spirits of the catalog of the Yars Goetia. And that just took me in a completely different direction than, than where I thought I was going to end up. As they usually do, right? Yeah. As they usually do. Yeah. The spirits, they have, uh, they have a knack for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it was it was interesting because it, it really came out of nowhere. It came out of nowhere. And as a matter of fact, and I'll talk a little bit about I'll talk a little bit more about this, that I started to get into that stuff. I was I was married. I was in a really bad financial situation. So I was very, you know, I turned to the working with the the spirits of the Goetia because I'm like, yo, I'm in such a crazy situation. <laughs> I need mm. like I need some serious, serious spiritual intervention here. You know, so I I picked up a copy of Jake Stratton Kent's true grimoire i read it through i was like ah, i don't think i could do this but this looks interesting but from there you know i discovered the afro-brazilian tradition of kimbanda and i found actually i it was uh, I, I i was able to connect with uh nicolaj de matos frisvold who wrote a couple of books on the tradition of kimbanda i would eventually get known as a consulta from nick which is essentially a report on who your kimbanda spirits are and 
those spirits began to work virtually immediately. They made their presence known very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, a week after I got my consulta, I met a woman at my, I was introduced to a Brazilian woman that was taking a, a, a course at my, pre, at my old job I used to work for. Her. And she brought me to a temple that was run by an Umbanda and Kimbanda, very closely related and, and very long story, long story short, one tradition emerged out of the other because there's no central body that governs the way people mm-hmm. practice Umbanda and Kimbanda. Mm-hmm. You know, there are some places that practice Umbanda exclusively, other places practice Kimbanda exclusively, and then some places practice them in tandem. So I got it. So from there, I got a chance to work with the spirits of that particular tradition. Um, mm-hmm. I would go every Sunday, I would take my daughter to what was known as a Jira. And the Jiras are these big events where there's someone that's conducting the, the ritual of the Jira. There are assistants to the mediums and the mediums call down their spirits and they get possessed by their spirits. And, you know, the spirit will give you a message, you know, usually some spiritual encouragement. Sometimes they'll give you some guidance. It's like, you know, they'll give you, it's like an oracle, you know, then they'll energetically cleanse you. And then they'll usually give you something to do, like light a candle and think about this spirit and then come back next week and we'll do it all over again. So I was, I was going to the temple, I would say for about consistently, I was going about four to six months. And I got to the point where I started to get trained to what's known as incorporate. You know, you bring down the spirits temporarily into your body and it's a light, it's a very light form of possession. Yeah. It's not full possession because I remember everything, but the spirit definitely takes over. So I was trained in how to incorporate these spirits. And even though I was going to an Umbanda temple, I, my heart was set on being initiated in Kimbanda, but it just was in, it wasn't accessible to me. And from there, I mean, this was like a big period of experimentation of, with different with different systems. So even though I was going to the Umbanda place, I was also working with certain spirits of, of the Ars Goetia, a very modern grimoire. I did not do it traditionally. I used a modern grimoire called Demons of Magic. And I took a shot. I was like, yo, this has to work. <laughs> it has to work. I did some stuff that's in that book with one mm. of the spirits named Gremory. And then a month and a half later, yeah. I, got, I got out of my financial situation. That's great. And it lasted for about a year and a half. And then eventually I would make it to Brazil. I got received licença into the tradition of Kimbanda. So while I'm not a, uh, I'm not a Tata and I can't initiate anyone, you know, I have Mm -hmm. a license to work with my spirits and by proxy, whatever spirits that happen to roll with them. And I eventually, I eventually found your group because I had began to experiment with Arabic magic that came out of uh, but very interestingly, that came out of something that I did with another spirit in the Ars Goetia, Barbatos. I performed. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. I yeah, didn't yeah, know yeah. That. Yeah. So, so I was, uh, I was taking um, Jason Miller's uh, Black School of St. Cyprian course, and um, I performed a baptism of two different spirits. Uh, one of them was Barbatos. The other one was Priscillus. And so after I baptized Barbatos, I know, like I paid it, I paid attention to what was going on in my life because none of these encounters uh, with these spirits had me deal with them physically. You know, the Kimbanda spirits made themselves known mostly through dreams. And, and there was a major intervention, like they, there was a major intervention in their life, in my life that helped me get to Brazil, which I could tell you about later. But what I, the point that I want to impress upon everyone is that the majority of this work did not require me to see the spirits. It didn't require me to really, didn't require full conjuration. I did stuff and it worked. And where I paid attention to is I paid attention to what events took place after the ritual, what new people started to show up in my life. Like what were some of the avenues that I got opened up? Yes. And, yes. You know, so sh- shortly after the Barbatos uh, baptism, I ended up meeting someone online very, very, very good practitioner. They have a lot of passion in their, and the way that they work is very methodical and scientific. So we immediately hit it off. They had a mentor that was, that was beginning to teach them Arabic magic. And eventually uh, we decided that we were going to do an experiment 
to conjure uh, a gin. And I was like, wow, like, so this thing with Barbatos resulted in somebody showing up in my life was introducing me to Arabic magic. And it just so happens that I was able to introduce that person to somebody that proved to be a very valuable relationship for that person. You know? Wow. Yeah, it was amazing. like they were actually like this person was looking for someone like the person that I ended up connecting them to. And those two just hit it off. And it's just it's amazing, which which it's interesting to note that one of Barbatos's um, abilities, so to speak, or his office is reconciliation of friends. So how that plays out in life is through this spirit kind of turns you into some sort of connector where you connect people with others, you know, Absolutely. So that's, that's how that plays out among other things. Anyway, so we decided to do this experiment and we came across two different rituals. It was about, it was a small group of us that each decided to conjure the same genia um, oh. using two different rituals. We, me and the person that I met, we used one and then the person I connected them to, they used another one. Initially, when I performed the ritual, I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I just, it was just like, here, try this ritual and let's see what happens. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know fuck around and find out. Yeah, exactly. So we did this experiment and it seemed to produce whatever results that I produced for the, you know, for the different people. Eventually, what I ran into is it's almost impossible to get any sort of reliable information in English. Uh, at least for me, because one, I don't read Arabic. Yeah. Okay? I don't speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. um, and I noticed that there's also uh, culturally to work with these spirits is very, very, very taboo. It's very like you just don't like. Absolutely. Yes. Almost every gin tale <laughs> that you hear of, you know, as an English speaking American practitioner that is that was trying to make sense of the nature of these spirits and their relationship and how they work, uh -huh. and like what they don't like. It was almost impossible to find straight answers. Absolutely. There's so, <laughs> many, there's so many stories and there's so many cautionary tales that, yeah. that don't seem to have any, you know, that don't seem to have, at least for me, they didn't seem to have any grounding in someone actually working productively with these spirits. There were some things that I noticed that, that were consistent. Like everybody has a gin story, you know? Like that's a clue. Like, okay, they like to be spoken of. They may not like to be seen, but they certainly like to be spoken of. And, you know, when I found the group, I was, I, I, had, I, I had just finished performing the ritual and I began to doubt that what I did was effective. And I began to doubt that who I called was, was actually who showed up, you know, which leads me to working with you, you know, but in that period, in that period between me beginning to do that initial ritual, and then the time that you and I connected, you know, I spent the, I spent a considerable amount of time um, listening to different podcasts of different natures, you know, so I listened to podcasts that were, there was a podcast that's run by a Muslim, I think he might be Pakistani. I think it's called If You See Something, Say Something. And they have a number of different episodes about the jinn. They have different people talking about the jinn from different perspectives. So there was an academic on the that on the uh, show that talked about the jinn. And there was people that told, you know, jinn stories that they would hear when they were kids or jinn stories that rem that they remembered that their family yes. would tell one another. But what I never found was an, an actual account of somebody that from A to Z this is what they did, and this is the result and the outcome of their relationship with the jinn, whatever, you know? I also ran into my own biases because here I am, you know, I'm part, also, I, what I forgot to mention is that I also got initiated into the Afro-Cuban tradition of Palo, Palo uh, Briumba. So here I am, I'm in these traditions that have a, have what for me is a amicable, productive, and beneficial relationship out of working with the unseen mm -hmm. and I'm looking at the amount of what appears to be like cultural resistance and cultural avoidance I was having a hard time reconciling that for myself because I'm just like how is this even possible you know like what are the Muslims on Africa doing that work with the jinn like how are they you know what I'm saying like how right that? a so, clear dichotomy and then I discover well, I'm thinking that jinn is like a class of entity, but now I'm reading that the word just means anything that's unseen. There's different connotations of the word jinn, depending on what context you look at it from. And I'm like, yo, this is like 
finding a needle in the haystack. So that for me was like, gosh. And the thing is, I actually, I enjoyed where I was kind of coming from with my approach, aside from being purely experimental, I did have a practical goal in mind. And I had some misconceptions, you know, because you hear the gin are very powerful. And if you want something done, you go to a gin. But also, I think, but what's also important to keep in mind is that they have free will. So that was also something that I, that I never reconciled with them myself, like before I ended up working with you, I, I guess I had, it was a, I would say it was an immature set of expectations, you know, mm-hmm. like I would just, you know, I would do this ritual, this being would just appear in my room. Yeah, It would yeah. make itself known. It would communicate with me in the way that I communicate. It would do what I asked it to do. And it would require virtually no sort of, quote, romancing. And it would happen faster than I expected it to. You know what I mean? (laughs) And that's what was running the show when I was doing this experiment. You know, just to be completely honest, I think it's really important to say that because in my experience, it's good to check in with what is present before you do the operation. You know, it's very easy to rush in my experience, and I've I've done this, and I don't know about you, but speaking for myself, walking, like not necessarily emptying the mind and coming from having a beginner's mind, no matter how experienced. Absolutely. It's, you know, so I I can see that there were, I had, I had some very unrealistic expectations that were, I guess I would say inherited from some of the stories that I've heard and my own ignorance. Well, you know, it, it's it's really it's really not ignorance, and I'm happy to say you're not alone in that perception. Mm-hmm. Because, as you said yourself, when you when you go deeper into researching the topic of the gin, it's basically Aladdin's lamp, right? Mm-hmm. It's literally that. That's mm-hmm. their first uh, exposition to a gin when they were when they were children. That's where people, yeah. when they understand what a gin is, they think about, oh, you know, when I was a kid, I used to watch Aladdin. Mm-hmm. That you're just gonna rub this lamp and the gin will appear. You have three wishes and you can ask for a, a kingdom and you will get it in the you know, blink of an eye. But it's it's really not your fault. I don't think it's ignorance. I think that culture in general mm-hmm. that basically forces that view on people. Yeah. So I think you're not alone. Definitely yeah. not alone from different uh, interactions that I've had with people so far about the gym. Yeah. Well, that's re- <laughs> that's reassuring. But uh, <laughs> you know, but I think it's you know again, like I think it's valuable to at least own that I have biases and prejudices, and I have I have expectations that I enter into a ritual with, and if I Absolutely. don't stop and actually deal with, okay. I'm about to do this ritual. I'm about to call this spirit. What am I expecting? Yeah. And just acknowledge it to myself so that I can say, okay, that might not be how this goes. Let me give that up. Great. You know? That's great. And that, that shows a lot of maturity on your part, but also yeah. wisdom. Yeah. You know, you, you don't, you work magic, but you have to work with the magic, right? right? The spirits work with you, but you have to work with the spirits. If you ask for something they can't do, I mean, that's on you, right? Exactly, exactly. And that's something else that was at play too. I couldn't really, I didn't do sufficient research on the spirit that I was trying to work with. And frankly, there was virtually no about yeah, exactly. English. Exactly, yeah. You yeah. know, and and also like there's a, pro, and, I'm, and I intuitively knew that there's a protocol. There's a protocol and working with spirits I'm a big I'm a big mafia guy. I love mob movies. The I'm fascinated by how something like the mafia can exist. You know what I mean? Like yes. such a high stakes organization, but the code and the structure and the way that they conduct themselves amongst one another versus everyone else. When I look at working with spirits, I I try to I try to adopt this mentality. This this may not be this we're not here to do crime. But we're here to operate outside the, the, the standard rules of things. Absolutely. There's a chain of command and the chain of command needs to be followed. If you don't follow the chain of command and you don't get checked, you got lucky. I was telling a friend of mine one day, we were talking about building tools and he was like, such a pain in the ass. And I said, you know, I want to share something with you. I said, if you watch enough interviews about how they got into the mob, they got introduced to someone and what that person said to them was nice to meet you. I heard good things about you. And so what I, I really try to embody 
and I tell myself, you know, yes, this is going to be expensive. It's going to be time consuming. It's going to be inconvenient. It's an interruption. But at the end of the day, my intention is that they hear good things about me when that can, when that introduction is made. You know, so fast forward to meeting you. You know, I met you. I reached out to you. I actually commented on the group and I immediately, you know, I got very good feedback. You directed me to a reputable source. Eventually, yeah, I would reach out to you. And, you know, I would like to tell people how you helped me because you didn't, first off, you didn't have to. You did not have to. And you vetted me, which was the appropriate, the appropriate thing to do. But I want to leave people with the impression that not only did you just, quote, help me, but the depth of what you provided me with was mm -hmm. so beyond what I could see that I'm like, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sheree. But before we move on to the next question, sure, sure. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to highlight about your story. First of all is your experience. And when you, when you go back from the beginning, I mean, from what you told us about being part of that temple, you know, you told me you were practicing magic for 13 years, but I would say you've, you've been doing it for a lot longer than that because you started in college with the mm -hmm. turn and everything else. Yeah. And also it is, it is worth noting that I think because this is the first time I hear your full story is that every step, every spirit that you work with and every step of the way, like it guided you to the next step, you know, yes, and it yeah. guided you to the next step, you know, maybe those, you know, goetic spirits that you worked with, like you said yourself, they guided you to the next person, which guided you to the mm -hmm. group. And then after that, we connected. The other thing that I wanted to highlight here is that you're absolutely right that it, this is a very, very taboo topic. Mm -hmm. Like you have the, this richness of a culture about the jinns and the angels and magic. But mm -hmm. on the other side, you have the masses, which are saying they, you know, some people say they don't even exist. And in my, my native country, you are not even allowed to utter the word jinn because mm -hmm. that puts you at a risk of possession. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. For someone outside of that culture to find information, like you said yourself in English. And of course it has to be dependable. It has to be practical. And it has to be actionable. So good on you for forgetting basically everything you've known about the gyms and putting every preconceived notions to the side and then starting afresh. And I think that that sets you up for success in many, many, many ways. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to highlight is that you had a clear practical intention. Mm -hmm. You were not just doing this like, oh, maybe I'm curious about the gyms and I want to know if they exist and I want to prove to myself that I can do this or whatever. No, you had a practical goal and the gyms being extremely telepathic, they can sense that about us. They yes. can sense if this is just a person dabbling or mm -hmm. this is a person who is serious and they're looking to achieve things. And of course, this is something that attracts them to work with us because as you said yourself, they have free will. Mm -hmm. So no matter the conjurations, no matter the rebukes, no matter what we do, a lot of people forget that. They think it's all about the names of power and the divine names and this and that. But you can get a gin working for you today using those methods, but he won't be happy about it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this is what I wanted to highlight about your experience. Now for the second question, I think you already described this a little bit, is I was going to ask you, what made you seek a solution within this tradition? Like you did Salima, Kimbanda, and other stuff, and then you decided, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start working with the gin. Yeah. First off, it was kind of chasing down the theory that I wanted to verify for myself. And I was like, maybe there's a connection between Barbatos and the gin. Now, and it wasn't from like reading books and, you know, it was like, no, I baptized this spirit. And then I met a man, you know what I mean, that introduced me to this tradition. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So that tells me something about a potential relationship between this spirit and either either this spirit got such a good read on me or whatever I did, I was I was interested in verifying whether there is a connection or not. Is this spirit a jinn? Is this spirit like jinn adjacent? Like, do the, is there some relationship? Is it, uh -huh. is it a celestial relationship? Is it based? Are they controlled by the same angel? So that's what had me go with the Arabic tradition rather than rather than um, using my Kimbanda spirits to intervene in this particular situation or even going the Palo route, you know, but because they're down for whatever. You have to be aware of the consequences that come with that because while in the heat of the moment, one might want something, and this is part of 
what it is to, to practice Kimbanda. You are always at a crossroads. Everything that happens, that's your responsibility. Whatever you mm -hmm. give over to your spirits, whatever you task them to do, you own every piece of what comes with that, good or bad. So I wanted to test out this theory that I had about Barbatos. And then I also got interested in just, you know, I never worked with a gin before. So I'm like, all right, well, I hear great things about them. I hear they're very powerful. They work very quickly. And, you know, this is the situation that the situation I was in, I was promised a certain amount of money. The, the person that was involved, in my view, didn't handle it honorably. Stop taking my phone calls, stop taking my text messages, but they took my money. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I need to bring justice to this. You know, so I decided to petition this particular gym, which in this conversation I'm getting, maybe I was asking for something that was outside of their office. And maybe this is just something that they don't deal with. And also uh, the ritual that I did, I don't necessarily think that the spirit I was calling was the one that came. But something came, but I don't think it was the spirit that I called, which is what brought me to you. Now, here's what we did. We got our hands on a short ritual. It was incomplete. It was just a series of reciting a series of nonsensical words. I don't even want to call them barbarous words. There was no protocol. There was no calling of God first. Very interestingly enough, I will say that when I craft, when I wrote my, when I wrote my pact, which was terrible, it was a terrible fucking pact. <laughs> but um, when I wrote my pact, I opened up the pact with, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate. You know, I, I intuitively knew to include that, but then like, as I was working with the, as I was working the conjuration, I took that out. And I just, we just had, we just didn't have, it was, it was, we didn't have the right, you know, stuff. You know, we had the bad, we had a bad recipe. We yep, were trying to yep. bake a cake and God knows what we freaking baked, but <laughs> you know, so I do this ritual, you know, first, so I, I tried it a couple of times. I tried it once and then I just couldn't do it. Like it just re re required reciting this conjuration like 103 times. So the first time I tried it, I would get to like the 27th time and I'd pass out. I'm like, fuck. Well, here's what motivated me. Other people in the in our crew that were doing yeah. this, they were like, yo, I did this. I, I, I made the pack, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, I finally do it. And it's Compared to what was happening with other people, specifically the people that used a different conjuration to call the same spirit, mm. they got, you know, the, the, what showed up was, was very different than what showed up from, for me and this other person. So they got much more tangible results. Now I do this thing for three nights and I'm like, okay, I think it worked. I don't have any way of verifying what kind of divination do I use? So I paid someone to do like a Lenormand divination to confirm. And I'm like, do I need to do it for one more night? I do it for one more night. Yes. Then I think two days after I do the ritual, I go to work and my girlfriend texts me. She said, I just had the worst dream ever. And she said, I had a dream. First off, I was asleep. And then it sounded like it felt like somebody was standing over me and they clapped twice and they said, wake up. And I woke up and there was nobody there. And then I have this dream of this tiger eating a baby. It was like a lion eating a baby or something. Wow. And then she wakes up and she smells something burning, but there's nothing burning in the house. She smells rubber burning. And so I'm all, I'm like, all right, the spirit, which it was a female gin that we were called, it was Jania that we were calling. Yeah. So I come home that night and I like, I'm like, yo, you cannot fucking do that. You can't like, I, I'm just talking to the air. Like that is no pass. Then my girlfriend has a dream that same day. She has a dream that night. There was an older woman with gray hair. She knocked on the door. She was selling ice cream. My girlfriend opened the door. She walks into our apartment and then she walks into the room that I did the ritual in. She doesn't say anything to my girlfriend. She just walks right in and my girlfriend's like, what the fuck are you doing here? And then the woman gives my girl ice cream in the dream. She gives her her favorite. Mm. And then I was like, okay, so maybe the spirit is reconciling with you because I fucking yelled yeah. at you. So in the days after that, I receive a set of what's called chamalangos, uh, which is what we, what they're four coconut shells that are used in, uh, to speak with the spirits in uh, Impala. And I received them from a Tata. And so I'm like, let me use my chamalangos to try to talk to the spirit. So I'm throwing the shells day after day, asking them questions. And I have no idea if the information that I'm getting is good or bad. I'm just right. I'm just recording it, writing notes. And then one day I have a dream. And it's, this is important. This is important because especially in the African traditional religions, dreams are very important because spirit, most spirit interactions happen in dreams. So anyway, so fat, so rewind back to this dream. I'm having this dream 
I'm in this weird elevator and the elevator takes me to what looks like a workshop inside of this industrial sewer like you know location and there's this androgynous like figure that walks by me and I can't see what they look like it's just a black they're they're a silhouette but I can it, it's interesting because because it, at first appearance I can't see them I just see a black an all black figure I can see into the silhouette and it was it was like a dandyish looking woman with very short hair and she looked like prince like the art like the, the 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 singer and then that night that night i like i wasn't awake i was still asleep but i felt something walk past the foot of my bed and caress my foot and i was like oh shit maybe the spirit maybe this gin the gin is here you know what i mean like yeah. they're here. And then I would only have two more interactions with them. And this kind of ties back to something that you said about them being extremely telepathic. So one, you know, so one night, maybe like a week or two after that incident, I'm laying in the bed. Earlier that day, I have a thought in my mind that I'm going to experience seeing a spirit and it's going to, it's going to be somewhat frightening. You know, like when you get, when something scares the shit out of you, like you freeze yeah. Your body, like your blood gets cold. So I'm in bed, I'm half asleep. And all of a sudden, I feel a presence in the room. And I feel that fear. And then I have a, like this, I it's like this idea just kind of like precipitates into my head. And it was, I can't show myself to you, that'll break the rules. That's like, yeah. that's what the, uh, that was the, the message, you know. And so I'm like, yo, this gin is is, is talking to me, you know, she's letting me know, I'm not going to show myself to you. Yes. I, I can't, it's against the rules. Yeah. And then, and then the last experience that I had, I was, was laying down and I was asleep and I felt someone physically poke me in my back. I got it. Like they they just want to fuck with me. They don't, you know what I mean? Like they're just going to fuck with me. And then I started to doubt that what I did worked specifically. Oh, and then I also had a really, uh, I also had another dream and I told you about this dream, but I, I'm, I'm okay to share it with people. I had a dream that I ended up at this weird hotel where there were no walls. There were just oh. beds everywhere. I ended up at this weird hotel. And there was a friend of mine that showed up in the dream. And all she wanted to do was have sex with me. And <laughs> yeah, that's it. She accosted me and we ended up, we ended up having sex in a dream. Now, here's the thing. I only have these kind of dreams when there's a spirit involved. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I've never been one to have dreams like that, that actually resulted in the act being performed in the dream until I started to work with spirits. And every other dream that I may have had like that typically ended right before the act, but the act was carried out. And then the girl just, you went all the way. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And she just took off, you know, one thing I, and I think I remember reading about this Jania and it's like, when she comes, she'll offer herself to you and you tell her. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. But the thing is there was no telling this, this, no, it, they took it. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I didn't get raped. (laughs) I'm not saying I got raped, but it was just like, I was down. You know what I mean? Like my dream, yeah. dream Sharif was down for whatever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's really funny to talk about this stuff, but that's what happened. Yeah. That's what yeah. happened, yeah. you know? So I'm like, okay, maybe the spirit got what they, what they wanted. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. nothing's happened since. I did have the experience that they sort of, like it didn't take much to communicate because we, all I had to do was just think, you know, like I didn't necessarily have to do a ritual to call them forward. After I did the the initial ritual, if I, if I send thoughts in their direction, I'll get something back, you know, like they, like, it was almost as if like, like who was showing me all of these things about the gin was this particular gin. You know, yes, like, absolutely. Uh, like, like, all right, if you're going to do this, I'm going to show you what you need to know. Yes. Not gonna, like, that's, and that's the extent to which you're going to get to know me. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I'm not going to do these things that you're asking me to do, but I am going to, I am going to, I am going to make it a point for you to at least have the inclination to learn about what you're about to get yourself into and learn about us. Yes. And I think in many ways, it's better than what you could have asked. Yeah. Totally. Because look what I came away with. Like I had to, confront all of my programming 
you know, black New Yorker that is involved in all of these traditions trying to enter into what appears to what appeared to me as a very, very closed, secretive tradition. You know, so I was very fortunate that they didn't get offended by anything that I did and they didn't get upset with me, you know, because there could be a problem, you know. And that's when I came to you and I'm like, yo, this is what's happened so far. <laughs> you know, I need your support and in, in, in getting this sorted out because I want this to work. But now I have this other problem on my hand. You know, I, I did something and I don't necessarily know what the ramifications are going to be. And I'm I'm not and I don't know what the what the protocol is yeah so a lot of a lot of the things that you said I mean they and I hope the listeners are paying close attention to every word that you said because you mentioned a lot of very very important points now what stuck with me is first of all Barbatol Barbatol mm -hmm. as you said you wanted to know if he has a relationship with the gym yeah now I think now with your experience working with me and the spirits you know that Barbatos is a gin and west they may call them you know demons but spirits yeah. or whatever but they're basically gin yeah you know, as you mentioned before another thing that you that you uh mentioned is the fear and the interaction through dreams are very 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 real that spirit when it comes it knows your deepest darkest fear it's there to test you mm -hmm. that and it's kind of a rite of passage like if you can get through that fear and like you said yourself i mean your body freezes and they feed on that fear and they make it grow because not only are they telepathic but they can interact with their emotions mm -hmm. and another interesting thing that you noted is that as you said yourself this is queen aina aina daughter of Iblis. Right. She's mm -hmm. advertised as a daughter of Iblis and she has millions and millions and millions, even, you know, trillions uh, as, as her army and servants serving her. And she said that she can't show herself to you that that would break the rules. Now, imagine this is this is a Satan, you know, what in the West would be called a demon, a lawless mm -hmm. criminal. Right. Mm -hmm. But she still respects rules. Coming back to what you were saying about the mob. Right. They're yeah. criminals. But exactly. They, also, they have their own rules. And they have their own code. Exactly. So you got it. It's so important because it's so it's, I'm so glad that you said that, because I think a lot of people when they I and this is basically what I see, you know, when I say I think a lot of people, it's what I see on social media when people come to social media and they talk about their experiments. You can tell contextually they are coming from a particular context. And that context is you do what I tell you to do. What yeah. even the ones, even the ones that are like, no, I'm really nice to the spirits. I give them offerings. No, <laughs> you are you are bribing them Absolutely. to get them to do what you want. There's no you, know, so you got so like that's why it's so important to really take stock of what you are expecting, what and take and and, and know what your relationship or what's automatically there what's automatically Absolutely. there with no thought you know and what's what was automatically there for me with no thought is that the spirit's going to do what i'm asking it to do for no other reason than i'm asking it to do it i didn't call on god's permission i didn't call yep. the angel that rules it that's like that's like me going to a to a that's like me going to a mafia capo and saying i, I need you to kill that boss and the order didn't come from the commission yep. and it didn't come and i'm a soldier or no, even less. I'm an associate. I'm not even a made guy. Exactly. You're, you're not you into to, the organization. Yeah, yet. but I want you to. I want you to kill the boss, or I want you to rob this store. It's crazy, you know. So like the code is so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was glad that you brought that organized crime metaphor because. It, it's funny, and we've never, ever talked about this. And a lot of the things that you mentioned now in this interview, we've never talked about them, even though, you know, we've been, we've been talking now for months. Yeah. That this is an, an example that I always use to bribe demon princes, kings, uh, especially the Goetia. I tell people, they're like crime boss. You know, they have this reputation of being ruthless, you know, being destructive. But talk to their servants, aides family right they could be great fathers and mm -hmm. the people who you know who are under their underlings i mean they think you know they're the best people in the world right right so so demons and goetic spirits even though they have this bad rep and being qualified as quote-unquote satan mm -hmm. i mean you could definitely get good results with them if 
and only if you know how to treat them properly. He is a criminal, but he could be the best person in the world. And I've said it even in my live classes is that they're nice to be around. You know, mm -hmm. they know how to have a good time. Like mm -hmm. angels don't, right? Yeah, so. yeah, angels don't. <laughs> they're all business. <laughs> exactly. So the no. next question I wanted to ask. Now you yeah. have told about what made you seek the solution within this tradition. Now I want you to talk a a little bit more about how I helped you, how, you know, the guidance and assistance, because it wasn't just guidance, because a lot of people, you know, they would tell you, okay, well, you should try think about doing this or try thinking about this. But for me, it's, I took an active approach, you know, where I yeah. typed, you know, I typed the, the pact with you. I gave you the conjuration. So I yeah. just want you to talk a little bit more about, about yeah. all that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, when I came to you, the first, you know, the first thing that you did was you were like, I'm going to look into this. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like you were like, yes, let's do this. And this is what it's going to cost you and blah, blah, blah. No, it was not like that. You know, mm. it was very much like, I'm going to, I'm going to look into this with you. And you had to do your own, you know, consulting to, to make sure that what I was attempting to do was not going to be abused or, you know, the value of it wouldn't be appreciated and that I was trustworthy. And that's, and this is something that I've I've come to appreciate after doing the ritual that you gave me is that something, at least for me, something happened that became more important than the material result. And that was the, I guess the best way to describe it is like the spiritual connection that started to happen and the spiritual clarity that began to, um, that began to slowly uh, unfold after the ritual, you know, leading, mm. even leading up to the ritual, you know, so there was something sacred. It wasn't just a business transaction, you know, so there was that. And then, you know, as we began to, you really were great at diagnosing what went wrong and identifying and making clear why what I was doing was ineffectual. It was like, yo, first off, this is not going to work. And I'm going to explain to you why. And in the explanation, what became clear was that the ritual that we were given didn't adhere to basic fundamental protocol. You know what I'm saying? That's number yeah. one. And then number two is you had asked me about, you know, my relationship with God. Yes, and made it very clear, very, very clear that, look, we can do whatever we think is going to work, but unless we have the permission of God for the working to be successful, it ain't going to happen. And this is not just in the Arabic tradition. This is in the Western tradition. This is even in, you know, it's even in the African traditions. Although, like, for instance, in Palo, everything's done by Insami. You know, that's the highest God. You know what I mean? The, the Mayoral, there's, you know, there's the, uh, the, the boss of all the spirits. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So in every tradition, in every model, there is something that, has the most agency and essentially approves the request like approves for things to happen. So everything happens with God's permission, you know? Absolutely. So Absolutely. that was very, that was a really important, I took that very, very, very seriously. And then once we established that, then you asked me about my experience just to get a sense of my background, you know, which I would imagine gave you a better idea as to how to work with me, what questions to ask and what to direct my attention towards and every the way that you work with me is that you you ask questions that allow me to arrive at my own conclusions you didn't just tell me xyz you had me look you know and it was in the looking that i was able to see the soundness of your approach thank you like, you know, there are many reasons that I did that and that I proceed the way that I do now, you know, you came to me and you're like, okay, I'm trying to, you know, I did this ritual with this demoness, right? This, yeah. this satanic, you know, um, daughter of a belief. And I'm like, well, you know, I use angel, I use divine authority. There was definitely um, a bit of, um, you know, hesitancy at that moment and that's when i started asking you about god and you yeah. said that uh, a devout believer not mm -hmm. always that you go to church every sunday and i don't think that's necessary because faith is in the heart and not whatever is out there mm -hmm. um so that was very very important for me to quote unquote vet you as they know you're coming before you're coming yeah so i'm yeah. like if, if i'm bringing this guy to this specific spirit 
I want to make sure that it doesn't, you know, affect my reputation with them or my relationship with them. You know, mm -hmm. I want to bring the right people to them. It's at that point that I thought that the situation that you needed help with, with the person ignoring you after taking your money, I think that was unfair. And I think it was a valid reason. And let me say this again, a valid reason to do magic and to seek spiritual help. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's when I direct you to Thursday's king, because he's a judge, right? He is known as the judge and he would bring the, the best resolution to this situation within what's possible, of course, you know, right, because right. let us, let us remember these gods are not all capable. They're not omnipotent. Like a lot of people believe and they have their limitations and they will work with what they can do for you. Yes. So this is also why. I ask questions is if, you, if I ask you a question, right? And that realization comes from you. It's better than if it's, I just tell you what it is because uh, it's exactly it's from yourself. Yep. And the uh, other thing is, is that a lot of these, you know, quote unquote, magical experts or teachers or whatever, they'll just tell you, okay, forget everything you, you know about mine is the truth, the supreme word about everything magic. And you just do as I say, without questions, whereas magic is built on belief. So if I'm really vested in your interest and in your success, I want you to believe in what you're doing. Not just tell you do it because I told you so, yep. right? That's why I take the time to explain the logic behind every step of the way. Now, and this is the next question is how did it benefit you for having yes. that? You know, how, yeah. how did it benefit you to have these? I think because at the point of you doing the ritual, there wasn't a question of, oh, do the gyms exist or are they really powerful or are we really there? I mean, I think, you know, this is about just executing the operation. Like yeah. It was no, because a lot of people, and I want to stress this, the most important component of magic is belief. Mm. So how did that benefit you in that respect to have that, you know, the, the step-by-step -step process with me of questioning and telling you what didn't work? Well, first off, it was really great because you didn't just disregard and you didn't you didn't uh, invalidate what I was doing, what I was doing. You just simply made the case and invited mm. me to look at why this would be ineffectual. You know what I mean? So that was really, yes. that was really powerful. But then also, also like you, not only that, but you also walked me through a structure, like a structure of flow and then like uh, uh, an hierarchy in order to do the things in what was, uh, and I'll tell you what the practical value in that was was even though a majority of my practice is within the context of the Temple of the Lima and, and that particular school, what I failed to do that, that became evident to me and was very clear in the way that you set me up was that I failed to like take into account that even there, there is an order of which things are done and a spirit yeah. is invited. You know what I'm saying? It just, it just wasn't, like I, I wasn't looking from that perspective. I was looking from, this is the jinn, that's Temple of the Lima. It's not, the two shall not meet, you know, which didn't, which was not, the way that things ended, I couldn't have been more inaccurate. But you also, I did not know how to make, write a pact. I didn't yeah. know how to write a successful pact. And so hearing like the, hearing like the way that you, and seeing the flow that you created and seeing the way that you wrote the pact and how you, how you enacted the like enacted the pact and recited the pact that for me was tremendously valuable here's what it did it took like the significance out of writing the pact mm -hmm. and it made it much more natural you know and even for me to be the one to recite the pact when the time came to do it it wasn't coming like where i was before i started working with you was like it was coming from a place of like i hope this is the right way to do this but by the time i finally i executed what you taught me to do I was able to do it with full confidence because it made perfect sense. There was nothing that was unclear about the instructions that you gave me. Everything mm. was very clear. It all made perfect sense. It all followed a particular logic. And that, and that allowed me to be really comfortable and confident with what I was doing. Now, leading up to, you know, so you gave me the instructions, okay, and you gave me the day and time to do it. And as I began to start to prepare for the ritual, two things happened. One, I initially was planning on doing it on one day. And then I realized, wait a second, I'm not set up to execute it this day. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to force it. At that, at that time, we were dog sitting. So we had two dogs in the house. I was like, all right, this isn't going to work. So we, I waited until the dogs 
left and then it was the first Thursday after they left and I remember emptying out my room because you you told me this room needs to be very very clean like it needs to be as clean like like you like the queen herself can sleep in your room yes that's true that's you know true. so I so I emptied out the room I vacuumed the floor and then I looked around the room the, the, the walls in the room are all white so I looked around the room and I was like okay, this isn't, this isn't enough because the walls were like really scuffed and they had all these marks on it and shit. And so I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to have to paint the room for me to repaint the room, which my girlfriend wanted to paint the room anyway, but this was what got me to do it. You know, she yeah, wanted to, exactly, do it, to right? even decorate the house, but yeah, then it was yeah. like, no, I'm doing a magical operation and the room needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's time to redecorate the house for real. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, no, this has to be painted, you know? So I painted the entire room. You also told me to remain as possible in a pious state, really keep asking permission from God to make this happen, which I did. You know, I abstained from having relations with my girl. I, I didn't abstain from drinking alcohol, but I painted the room and I burned incense in the room for like three days. I tried the ritual twice. The first time I tried the ritual, I got up at 4 a.m. and I fucking baked an enormous tray of baked ziti to offer to this king. <laughs> so so this, this was my next question, just so the listeners know, this was my next question. Tell us about your experience doing this ritual. Yeah. Because this is, you know, you've told about the other spirits, you've told about Queen Aina, you told, I mean, all these spirits from different registers who are all powerful. But yeah. what we need to focus on is your experience versus other experiences in the past. Absolutely. All right, so leading up to the first, trial of the ritual you know I painted the room and I remember I was standing outside I, I was outside for something I don't remember I think I I think I went to take out the trash I was walking back into my building and I was thinking about a verse from the book of Enoch and I don't remember what verse it was but the gist of it is everything has its place in time and for some reason that seemed like so such an appropriate thing for me to be contemplating given what I was about to do. Here I am, I'm about to call forth a Jin King, species of being that can't show themselves. Like there was something, but in contemplating that, what started to appear to me is that not only did everything have its own place in time, but everything had its own design. You know, a tree that grows oranges is not gonna grow olives one day. And I just got struck by the fact that the universe has been meticulously put together by a creator. And I had a place in their creation. It would be in my best interest to learn to really reel myself back a little bit and live a life where maybe I just let the creator reveal to me what he wants me to do or what it wants me to do. Man, that's so deep. But I just want to point out to the listeners that you know, this man has been doing this for, I don't know how many years. And now when he's starting to talk about the ritual, let's just pay attention to the kind of realizations and the kind mm -hmm. of thoughts that come to his mind. And it's not just, you know, sometimes it's a thought and it's fleeting and you don't really listen to it, but Sharif took them on. And just for us to pay attention to these realizations, because the spirits work on our mind. So I will, I will let you go on, but I just, yeah. you know, that would, that for me needed to be touched on that realization that everything has a time and that we have a place in the universe. Yeah, and we need to figure out where we fit in. Basically. Yeah, yeah, this exactly. Whole creation concept of a master divine plan, right? Going yeah. somewhere, we have to find a role to play here. So yeah, keep going. Yeah, please. yes, you know. So I be, so I really leaned into that realization that night, and I really kept contemplating, and then got to a place where I had realized, like, not only did everything have its own place in time, and that that there is a design to to reality you know and that there's a creator and and how generous must the creator be that it thought you know what i need something called a sharif a human being i'm going to make them a human i'm going to put them on earth at this particular time because i got all this other shit going on and that is going to help me with this. You know what I'm saying? And my whole existence gets set in motion. As, a, as I always like to say, we're not here on an 80 or 90 year old vacation. We're here for a purpose. Yeah. And 
nothing is without a purpose. You have shit to do, you know? Mm. And so in everyone, in everyone, you know, it's not just me. It's like, if you're a human being listening to this, something higher thought it needed you here. You know what I mean? Like to fulfill on its plan. And so, which interestingly, this started to radically and permanently alter anything that I thought Islam was because the next logical thought was what's being pointed to by the word Islam is the peace that comes from living completely and wholly in accordance with whatever the creator wanted for you. And Islam. Never, then for me, I was like, wow, that's Islam. That's the, literally the meaning of the word is surrender. Yeah, yeah. Complete surrender to yeah. God's will. It is a pretty vulnerable place to be yeah. and very frightening thing to do for us, but we're supposed to surrender to his will. Now, are you comfortable sharing about your physical experiences, which you felt, you know, the sensations? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, the yeah, yeah, I'm going to get into that. So, yeah, so, so there was this, so I noticed that there was this exalted state existing leading up to the ritual. And it felt like just everything is going to, like, if, if there was no worries about what was to come, you know, the mind worries, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, yes. it, in the face of uncertainty, the mind entertains predictions that it makes you know what i'm saying that's yeah. just part of having a mind but i knew that there was something special that was shifting because it felt like there was this pocket that was open up and and there was like wisdom that was being poured into wow. me you know what i'm saying and then the first attempt at the ritual i get up at four in the morning i make this enormous tray of baked ziti the ritual was supposed to happen during the hour of jupiter at least start during the hour of Jupiter. I thought it was supposed to happen during the hour of Jupiter. By the time I was done cooking and I prepared the the offerings and stuff, I had, it was like 7.45 and I'm like, shit, Mm. it's almost, I got like 10 minutes to do this thing. So I rushed and then I told, and then I came back to you and I was like, yo, I did it, but here's what happened. And you were like, (laughs) you were like, okay, that's cool. But you know, you ask for like four different things, bro. You got to have an offering for each thing that yeah. you asked for. You, you didn't have to like stop at the end of the hour of Jupiter. You could have, you could have gone on, but I think it worked. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it again on Sunday because that was the other period of time. Sunday yes. during the first hour of sunset, which is an hour of Jupiter. So Sunday rolls along. I'm in my office with my girlfriend. We're sitting next to one another. We're both doing some work. And then I stop and I look to my right and to my right, there was a window and on the windowsill, I have like four books. I have Techniques of Greco Egyptian Magic by Dr. Stephen Skinner. I have the Goetia of Dr. Rudd, also Mm -hmm. by Dr. Skinner. I have a copy of the Quran and I have a copy of the Book of the Law on this windowsill. And I just grabbed one of the Qurans that I have and it was called the Study Quran. And I decided to open up to the school of the, the gym. And I had up to that point, I avoided reading about it because for some reason I thought it was going to say something bad about the gin because I was like, yo, the, the, what? It's the Quran. can be good. Passionate about the gin. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, yo, they're probably talking mad shit about the gin. You know, yeah. I, I'm not, I don't, I don't need that. You know, I got it. <laughs> But something told me to grab the Quran and open up and read that surah. So I opened up, I read that surah. And, and then I read the notes this, that this was a, uh, the surah was about the, like the story of the jinn. But in the notes, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he recited another surah. And the, mm. recita- and the recitation of the surah attracted the jinns. Like they just happened to be passing by and they were like, yo, what's that? And then yep. they heard it. Yeah. And they were like, okay, we accept this. I think the name of the Suda, I forget the number, but I think it's called the Mo- the Compassionate. Yeah, Ar-Rahman, yeah. So, so I'm like, okay, so this is what I'm going to use to open up the ritual, the Compassionate, and then I'm going to read the Jinn. Like to step into like the mythical language of what I was about to do. So the time comes and I'm calm. I'm not, ner- I'm not nervous. I'm like, all right, we're just going to do this until something happens. So I open up with the compassionate, take a minute, read the jinn, and then I take a minute and then I recite the ritual that you gave me. And then I get to, I get to the part 
where it's the rep the recitation of the the call to have the gym come. And I do that about maybe 20 something times. I'm sitting on my, I'm sitting on the floor, kind of like kneeling on the floor, doing it. And then all of a sudden I feel what feels like little strings starting to attach themselves to my, to my shoulders. It's like these little faint, like spider webs of strings that slowly start gently attaching themselves to my shoulders, continuing the recitation. And then I fall into a trance, like a slight trance. Mm -hmm. And then I feel this wave of like ecstasy come over me. And then I recite, I recite it again. And then I feel something gently press on my back. It wasn't a hand, but it was something like a pressure. Yeah. It was like a real slight pressure around the, around your heart, basically the back of your heart, I think. Yeah. 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 It was a little bit, yeah. A little bit above my heart. I would say like somewhere around my shoulder, like somewhere around the bottom of my shoulder blade. So yeah, very close to the back mm. of my heart. And it was just like a gentle touch. And as soon as I felt that, I was like, boom, we went right into the pact, said what I needed to say. And then I was like, all right, it worked. There's, first of all, the, the stress right before a ritual. You were calm because mm -hmm. you knew what you're doing. You knew what you were going to say. You had structure. You had a, a, a clear process to follow. Then yeah. after this is a lot of people, they don't know if it worked or not. Like, remember, you know, your ritual with Queen Aina. Yeah, there was and, no and certainty also, if it worked. Exactly. But yeah. you, this, this time you lived it, you felt it and you know what went on. So mm -hmm. I think those are great points that you bring up. Tell us about the manifestation. So at this point you did the ritual, right? And so here's what ended up happening. So, so, um, so I think a day or two after that, after that ritual, I came home from work. I was, I worked in the office that week. I came home from work and I went to go check my mail. I was wearing, and I was wearing my backpack. So I open up the mailbox. And as I open up the mailbox, I feel a finger like slip between the strap of my backpack and my shoulder. And so I thought it was my girlfriend. So I turn around and there's nobody there. All right. They were like, yeah, it worked, bro. You're good. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. So then as time goes on, there was two things that I noticed. And then there was the material results. So I noticed that occasionally I would get this, the best way to describe it was like, there was like an invisible ocean and the tide of that ocean was rising. It was like an emo, it was the best way to describe it. It was like an emotional, physical sensation of, wow. like, of like a tide constantly rising. And then I noticed that my thoughts would, would become, I don't want to say holy, but the best way to describe it was like, I would just find myself like in the presence of generosity and happiness and appreciative of God, like an act of appreciation, like, thank you, God, you know what I'm saying? Constantly, constantly. And that was an indication of either the presence of the King or, or one of his most likely one of his, uh, his helpers. Yeah. Him being a, a King of Jupiter, you know, that experience of expansion of devotion, these mm -hmm. energetic impressions, then something else started to happen. I started to notice that I began to get ideas on how to restructure my finances and how to most importantly what the the idea that got pre impressed upon me is to start doing one thing that could result in like four or five different things expanding or moving and then building on those so the principle of expansion the nature of the thoughts that started to enter my mind all have this common thread of taking one action that could expand five or six different things. So I started to notice the quality of the thoughts. And then like I got some results, which was a 10% bonus, which was a $7,000 bonus, which was insane given the fact that last year was COVID-19 practically yeah. ravaged the whole world. And yeah. I've still qualified for a 10% a and a 3% pay increase of my wow. increase of my salary, you know, so like I got the bounty of Jupiter and then uh, and like something grew. The second to last thing is the best way to describe it is like, I have a real focus on growing things, you know, like specifically my finances, like setting up my finances. So things grow, not wasting them. Don't get me wrong. I haven't fully 
set myself up so all of my money is growing. But yeah. I'm about 30 to 40% in the process and managing my money so that every dollar has a job and a specific amount of money that I get paid is dedicated to growing. Sounds you know, like Jupiter thinking Jupiter, to me. All, yeah, ju- told, yeah. So this, so this is like, and it's a constant thing. It's not like a flash in the pan. Here's a couple mm. thousand dollars. Now mm-hmm. leave me alone. It's like, no, you asked for what you asked for. And this is how we're going to deliver on what you asked for. That's and amazing. That, yeah. And it's really great. And then lastly, you know, this year on the uh, first day of Ramadan, I officially converted to Islam. And I converted because it was in my heart to do so before. Now, it doesn't necessarily conflict with all of my other spiritual practices. And the intention, I just want everybody to know, the intention wasn't to get me to convert or anything like that. That's not. No, not at all. Not at all. You know, Um, but that was a direct result out of being faced with the reality that, you know, there's a creator and there's a design and the creator clearly had some necessity for all of us to do something. Absolutely. To, you know, Absolutely. to have some role to play in the fulfillment of its plan for the amount of time that we're on earth. So it was a very natural thing for me to do. That's so inspiring, man. And I didn't know if you were, if you were comfortable sharing about the fact that you converted to Islam. And of course, um, you know, you know me, I'm a pretty open guy. Uh, I, I accept all people. And it wasn't like, oh, you know, we're going to convert you, you know, yeah, it, it no. wasn't any, I, even, no. like, to be honest, I was surprised when you told me that. Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was, yeah. I was, I can, I can like really imagine that at all i mean you, you know a couple of months earlier you were you were summoning the devil the, the <laughs> devil's daughter God. right so a funny. couple of months later you're converting to islam which for me came as a shock but you told earlier mm-hmm. that you know you realize that there's a place for everything that you had this place within the universe you know i don't i wouldn't say that it was necessarily like i don't know my place in the universe per se but i know but one thing that is clear for me is that the creator was generous enough to think that I had some role to play. Like, that's the thing that blows me away. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, if you think about every fucking thing that exists in this universe, and I'm talking about the totality, you yeah. can't even compute it, but everything in, in the mm. totality of the known and unknown universe has some origin, has some originator, has something that said i need this like it mm. wasn't like oh, i really want this it's like <laughs> no given what i'm doing i need to have this and so just hanging out with the generosity of it and the interesting thing is it's not like an ego boost like it's not like oh god couldn't live without me no <laughs> it's not that it's like just you had a purpose in your creation yeah you yeah exactly like you kind of got to conf- like and it takes confronting like this shit didn't happen by i didn't get here by accident but i do think i do think there was some intention that is getting fulfilled which could be part maybe of one of the roles that i have to play and that is um being able to articulate what working with a gin is like with no bullshit with no fabrication with no agenda like yes. give them their respect and make sure that they're fairly represented in the english speaking world yes not this aladdin type you know bound no. genie no not no. at all not at all no. now moving on to the next question now you've talked about the ritual you've talked about the experiences and i know like you said yourself working with different kind of spirits registers from different traditions I would ask you to tell the listeners a little bit about what are the differences, like the first things that come to mind between working with the methods that I've provided you with and basically the rest of what's out there, even the the literature about the gin magic. So I would like to know basically what you notice as far as the differences. Yeah, well, the biggest difference is, and I'm going to say this word and it's orientation, and it obviously depends on which gin they end up working with, you know, but the influence of the jinn will orient you. I, I firmly believe there has to be a natural resonance in order to get like, for something like this to happen. The, the practitioner and the, and the jinn are already on the level. And it's just a matter of going through the process of just 
to discover that. So there's a particular orientation that I experienced in working with the gin that mm-hmm. I can't necessarily say happened with any of the other, nothing, nothing like this spiritually profound, even working inside of the, now one can argue I'm in the temple of the Lima. So this is probably something that's within the process mm-hmm. of that work, but that work is not geared towards employing yeah. spirits to do something and establishing relationships with spirits. Uh-huh. That work is designed to get you in touch with what it is that you're here to do in life. And then with Kimbanda, it's very ancestral. And Kimbanda, I don't want to talk about it like it's for survival or anything like that, because it's it's so much more than that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's so much more than that. But the one thing that I will say Kimbanda did for me that va- that's a little bit different than the, working with the chin is that those spirits are loud, proud, and they eliminated any doubt. They they do work to fortify your character, like in, in a different way than working with the gym did. And it's mu- in a much more sorcerous, amoral way. You know, working with some, with the spirits in the, cat- in the register of the Ars Gracia, that was more transactional, but also the depth of the successful workings you know, that also served to demonstrate that spirits exist and they can and will do work with us if they like us, you know, yes. if they don't like yeah. us, they won't fuck with us, you yeah. know, just like a person, if a person doesn't like you and they have, you know, and they have it within them to fuck with you, they'll do that. But it completely lacked the call to realign myself with the religious model that worked for me the way that uh, working with the Jin King did. And the second to last question, Basically, you have a rich background and experience in magic in general, different traditions. And also, you know, now you're getting to work with the gyms. Now, from start to finish, I would, I would ask you to just, first of all, in your life, mm-hmm. what value would you place on this whole experience from A to Z, start to finish? Well, I guess the best way to answer that, really look at it, you know, in the lens that it makes the most sense. And, and it's like, if I, like, this was no different than me going to you and hiring you to be a personal trainer. Mm-hmm. And you got me off the couch exercising, not just exercising, but now I'm able to exercise on my own. I'm losing weight and I've committed to a healthy lifestyle. Wow. That is the equivalent of what you, of what you provided for me. And I don't know how much a personal trainer is, but I know I, if I had to put a monetary value on what you provided, just the, before you even got to the ritual, just the consult and like the troubleshooting, easily 150 bucks. And then from, you know, from start to finish, you can't even put a price tag on it. But I would say this was easily worth, it was easily worth a thousand dollars. Here's why. And this is, look, look, you, you got to look at it like this. You took your time out. You asked me the right questions. You provided me with a workable model. You were approachable. You followed up. And lastly, you were just very generous. Thank you. And, and, but in all of that, I got to see your expertise. I got to see that you weren't just a dude that like wrote about some shit that you don't do. That's what makes it so valuable. Like, it's like, yo, I work out in the gym. Every day. Every day, <laughs> Every day I'm in the gym, like clockwork. Yeah, Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, so, the, so the results that I got are completely correlate to your own respect and regard for your practice. Thank you. And first of all, I'm really humbled. Also, just want to highlight a couple of things, as I said, even within the group, is that I am just one of the causes. God is the originator of Mm -hmm. of all causes. I mean, he created King Abul Walid, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He created you and he created me and he put us all together. Yeah. And you are the primal cause, right? Because you were coachable, you followed the instructions, and you did your own work. You know, a lot of the things I didn't tell you to do, like painting the room, I mean, that's that's a call only you could have made. Mm-hmm. And, and that shows your commitment, which is something, you know, the spirits, I mean, if, they're, if, they're, if you're going to ask a spirit, you know, I want 
prosperity, you have to show that you're willing to work for that prosperity. They don't yeah. want to waste their time and energy because they do spend their energy. They don't want to get tired and struggle for you if mm -hmm. all you're going to do is play video games all day. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you've gotten a raise, is that you deserved it. Right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to give a, a raise to someone who doesn't deserve it, yeah. no matter what the spirits tell them to do. So we just have to highlight also that there's this link between physical reality and spiritual reality that goes hand in hand. And it is about bringing the two together mm -hmm. and combining them. And that's what creates powerful and long lasting results. Mm -hmm. So you've shown commitment, you've shown openness, and you've shown that you are not here to just dabble. And those are all things that go a long way. Now to finish, and this is my last question, people who are going to be watching this and listening to this, who are where you were a couple months back, mm -hmm. who didn't know what the gins are, or basically they're hesitant because of all the cautionary tales and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the crazy accounts that you hear from people all over the internet. And now it's like these, there's this trend uh, this this popularity towards gins if only on account of the latest aladdin movie that disney made mm -hmm, right mm -hmm, people are mm -hmm. are wondering about this so what would you tell those people who don't know where to start beginners and advanced practitioners because you're as advanced as they come you didn't start this yesterday so what would you tell those people who are hesitant Mm -hmm. or don't know if it could benefit them or are they are they good or bad spirits what would you tell those people who are basically on the fence yeah that's a great question well the first thing that i would tell them is to make a commitment to learn what they can without coming arriving at any conclusion to spend any conclusion that they've that they've arrived at about what the jinn are how they work and what they can quote get from the jinn that's the first thing that I would do. Suspend anything that they think they know about the gym. Okay, that's number one. Number two is do an inventory on how willing they are to do this work. Because this is not something for nothing. Okay. Absolutely. Number three, I would say to, for people that are, I'm specifically talking to people that are like, like me, like Westerners, blah, blah, blah. Do the due diligence on the gym. Read the Quran. Read the Surah Al-Jinn, read the uh, Surah, Ar Ar uh, what is it, Al-Rahman? Al-Rahman, yeah, Al-Rahman, yeah. yeah. Read that Surah. Um, and then there are some podcasts to listen to. So find those podcasts on, uh, on iTunes and just listen to them without making any judgments, okay? And then once they know if this is something that they want to do, they should absolutely get in touch with you because mm. you're trustworthy. There are a lot of people that are not trustworthy and that are going to wow. take advantage. So also exercise a lot of discrimination, like the amount of discrimination that you have to exercise to find somebody that's going to show you what to do with no strings attached and no bullshit is unbelievable. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like an open, bubbly, trustworthy, naive, you know, guy, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? But yeah. even even after a while, I was like, whoa, I need to like, I can't be talking to each and every person that I encounter yeah. about this. Yeah, you know? sir. Not like racial or religious discrimination, but like you have to be willing to vet people. And if you're listening to this, absolutely hit up Retta and be ready to work. Don't waste time. Like people like to collect information, jump from this and that and try this and that. No, once you find, once... If if you are if you're somebody and you're gonna reach out to Retta, then you better do it ready to work, ready to pay him for his time. Cause trust me, it is it's worth it. Wow. It is so worth it. Okay. And be willing to find something out about yourself and the world and magic that you didn't even realize was, was available to you. Coachable, open-minded beginner's mind and just do what he tells you to do thank you, thank you. <laughs> that's what thank i have you. to say you're welcome um so this concludes our interview we had originally planned 30 minutes for this but i guess when you talk <laughs> about a topic that you're you're passionate about and of course you have a rich background and a huge experience in magic and i think 
You have a lot of teach people. You're getting more proficient and building that relationship every day because this is not said and done, right? You're still making offerings. Mm -hmm. You're still having manifestations. Like you said yourself, a lot of these, those other spirits is a transaction. Like, give me this for this and that's it. But when you make this pact, it builds up upon itself and you get mm -hmm. this momentum, which everything happens at one after the other. So it's mm -hmm. like the gift that keeps on giving, right? Exactly, 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 mm -hmm. exactly. That is exactly it. Now to finish, you are an experienced reader and yeah. I would like to let people know where they can find you, you know? Yeah, because... you can find me, you can find me on Facebook. You can look me up directly, Sharif Clark. You can also look at my business page, Convos Over Cards. Uh, my girlfriend and I, we are, we run Convos Over Cards together. The business page, we have a, many, many videos of us literally giving free tower card readings for people to check out. We're on a hiatus right now. However, I am accepting private clients. So if you want to book a private reading or you at least want to have a discussion about booking a private uh, card reading, just hit me up on Facebook or uh, look up Convos Over Cards on Facebook and follow the business page and shoot us a message on the business page. That's great, man. Now, lastly, I just want to thank you for taking the time also for this great idea. All credit to you. Um, Thank you, man. I, really I wanted people to know I've, you know, it's important to get testimonials, but I wanted it to be, I wanted people to have the experience of you and I in dialogue about this so yeah. that they can sense the authenticity behind it, because this isn't like, we're not like podcasters, you know what I mean? With yeah. books yeah. and shit, you know, we're just two yeah. people that happen to meet because we love you know, we love magic and we, and, you know, our, clearly our paths trust for the difference that we can make together, you know? So it was really important that people get exposed to this in this kind of format. Yeah, absolutely. And it's all through God's grace. So thank uh -huh. you once again, Sharif. My pleasure. And to the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, right? to and, the and, gift and that we'll, keeps on giving. Man. And to God, and you know, God, God first. Absolutely. So God <laughs> first and God last. You take care yeah. of yourself. And uh, hopefully that this will serve to answer a lot of people's questions.